Emergency investor warning. Prepare for hyperinflation and in food and energy costs in 2022. The global elite have forced Putin to flatten Ukraine in the coming weeks, and it may be uh, really ramping up this week, and I'm afraid. The Russian currency is collapsing, uh, so they have seen a massive, massive loss of value of the currency, creating insane inflation through Russia. The Russian stock markets imploded down 85%. And so now it's not even uh, able to trade here in the US. So good thing we did not buy RSX last week. And I believe the worst of this war is coming very soon. There's really no off ramp for Putin at this point. Uh, so until this does come to an end, there's two critical stocks to protect your wealth right now, which we'll cover in this portfolio uh, update. Our top selling advisory is up 5% in 2022, and most investors getting slaughtered down 10% are potentially much worse. Now, very similar strategy last year uh, with the same portfolio returned 233%. A lot of those gains happened in only a few months of the year. So you need to be patient, have your line in the water, and we will reel in the big fish Last year, every $10,000 turned into $33,000. What we're gonna cover now is a trade alert for $10,000. If you have 50,000, multiply by five. If you've got 100,000, multiply by 10. Or of course, if you call up Dean, he can give you a customized screenshot. Step one, buy 87 shares of UVXY. This is our stock crash insurance. Uh, typically, when people go bankrupt or negative, we see extreme volatility in markets, specifically the U.S. stock market. And that's what this is going to hedge you against. So as of recently, we've been seeing extreme movements in the prices of nickel, uh, which could have bankrupt a billionaire out in China who has the largest nickel mining operation in the world. Of course, he got bailed out. A lot of people are upset with that. Uh, we've seen extreme moves in oil, wheat, all sorts of these different hard assets. And so this has been creating uh, massive losses for anyone who has short those positions. Um, so that's where we've seen a lot of volatility coming through. There's also been some bankruptcies coming through the Chinese real estate market, uh, which seem to be getting worse. And of course, everybody in Russia uh, was bankrupt in about a 48 hour period. Uh, which is why Russia really has no option except to go full bore in the coming week. So UVXY is your stock crash insurance. And again, it goes up when there's a panic and limit down days in the stock market. We've been having a nice slow sell-off for several months. We have not yet had a outright panic. And at this point, I'm positioned for Russia to march over Ukraine, create a diplomacy, and then take a break from this warmongering. Uh, if we're about to develop World War III, uh, then of course we will adjust accordingly. At this point, I, I don't think that's in the cards and their most likely outcome is Putin goes for some sort of victory and then uh, immediately rushes into some sort of diplomacy. Uh, an attempt to recover his economy. So UVXY is critical right now. We'll sell it as soon as the dust clears, but I'm afraid it may get far worse next week. This product's up 70% year to date and has done a great job uh, helping guard our portfolio against these downside risks. Step two, uh, the second this de-escalates, expect energy costs to fall, bond yields to fall, and you wanna have exposure to technology stocks. Our favorite tech stock is actually a cryptocurrency, which you can buy with the ticker ETHE. This is the Grayscale Trust. It's trading at about a 25% discount compared to the real Ethereum at Coinbase. So we wanna pick up 217 shares of ETHE. This is the product we wanna hold for decades to come for massive returns. Think of it as getting into Microsoft when it was only about seven years old. Can you imagine how much money you would have made? In fact, if Bill Gates had never sold his position in Microsoft, 
he'd be by far the richest person on the planet. Okay, so uh, Ethereum's very similar into what Windows does for centralized operating systems. Ethereum's doing it for decentralized. And this year has been a big sales pitch for why you want to get out of centralized systems as governments weaponize money. If we look back just to 2017 in the last five years, Ethereum has gone up 19,000%. It has a fluid living ecosystem that's growing rapidly. And whether it's locking out money from Canadian truckers or kicking an entire country out of the, mon the monetary system, uh, everything is driving people to get their money out of the centralized world into decentralized. With this recent sell-off in Ethereum and about a 50% correction, beautiful time to go along this asset class. Now, again, you're getting a discount on the real Ethereum when you buy ticker ETHE, which is a OTC stock uh, that is ran by Grayscale Trust. Step three, pick up your boil. 97 shares of boil. This is US natural gas costs. Uh, Europe's slowly getting their act together to cut off purchases from Russia. And they're gonna start rerouting these orders to America. This is gonna cause the price of natural gas to go up. And it's also the best performing asset. The last two times the US went into a rate hike cycle. Okay, so we're about to begin hiking interest rates starting next Wednesday. It's most likely going to be slow and steady for the next two years. And this is to fight off inflation. And uh, so this is pretty much a done deal at this point. So during this period of war with Russia, one of their greatest threats to Europe is to cut off energy. And so uh, whether we look a year into the future with Europe trying to reroute its orders or a sudden spike caused by Putin himself, you need to be hedged and hedged heavily with boil. Now, again, the second this de-escalates, we will be selling UVXY and boil and reallocating capital primarily into Ethereum. Uh, but the coast is not clear. It is absolutely not clear. We need to be heavily hedged over this period of time. Now we've seen Boyle jump to as high as 55, crash back down to 30, and it's right back up to 40. So this is a great position for a portfolio uh, with oil already at 110, uh, with wheat futures at all time highs. Uh, this is really the asset that has the most upside return uh, with, that, with a lot less downside risk. Now, if we look at a table, we can see our asset allocation percentage. So right now, with 87 shares of UVXY, you have 16.4%. Uh, well, Oscar's asking why we're in Europe. That index has actually done very well over the last year. It did sell off in this mess. Uh, I'm expecting they're gonna have to expand debt and keep QE going longer due to this mess. Uh, so that's actually the, the bullish sign there. Uh, but yeah, we'll look at that chart in a moment. UVXY is our crash insurance play. We have 16% of our assets in that. Uh, and again, if we get an outright black swan event, we're going to expect UVXY to skyrocket up. If you're over 10%, you're heavily hedged. We're at 16%. We currently have 43% of the portfolio in Ethereum uh, at 217 shares. And then we have 40% of the portfolio hedged against energy risks or inflation risks with boil. Now the percentages will go up and down, the ratio of shares do not. So all you need to do is buy 87 UVXY, 217 ETHE, 97 boil, and then sit back and wait for the sell alert. I do expect us to be selling UVXY and boil within the next 30 days and then get very aggressive with Ethereum. So that's what I'm anticipating. No World War III right now. Uh, but again, this has been getting a lot hotter than I expected. And so we can't completely rule that out. Now, if and when a de-escalation is in the cards, energy costs could sell off rapidly, causing bond yields to fall. So the two trades I actually anticipate are to short oil with ticker drip and to also add to Ethereum. 
So those are going to be the two big plays that we want to get into. Now, as soon as oil gets back to a support level, which I think will be around 80, I do want to put us back into NRGU, which would be our leveraged big US oil and gas play. Here's a look at Brent oil. Uh, and so you can see when it goes above 100, it can last for several months, maybe half a year. Eventually, it will create chaos in markets in itself. So I do not think these prices are sustainable. In one way or another, we're going to end up with a oil crash. Uh, it could be from a de-escalation with Russia, or it could be the economy cr uh, crashing. So one way or another, uh, that will be a very important trade alert to go long drip and short oil prices back down. So it's, it's basically a very hyper leveraged uh, TLT play to bet that oil can crash. Here's a look at the treasury market. And you can see uh, it's been very volatile uh, during the March crisis. We got all the way up to 180. It's crashed down to 134 twice. It's at a very important resistance level. I find it highly unlikely that the TLT will go below, below this current level. If it does, there will be pain in the markets almost certainly. So we're actually expecting for the remainder of the year uh, for a relief rally in interest rates because the global economy is slowing down. Uh, there's not going to be new stimulus, it appears. Um, and in general, uh, every data point is dramatically slowing down on the inflationary side outside of food and energy. Now, falling bond yields most likely will moonshot cryptocurrencies and tech. And again, Ethereum's our favorite tech play for the coming uh, two decades. I do think it'll take two decades to really uh, mature this market. Now, I also want to point out the last time the US tightened, which means hiking interest rates and letting its balance sheet roll off, while China expanded credit, uh, which is exactly what's happening right now, Bitcoin returned 4,400%. Uh, during QE, bonds tend to perform poorly. During rate hike cycles, the bond market also performs poorly. This forces investors into alternative assets. The catch is, if you get the bond yield to match up with the inflation rate, uh, all hell breaks loose. So if you know this chart for Bitcoin, uh, peaking out at 20,000 bucks, what came next was an absolute carnage crash. And it's because bond yields got so attractive relative to inflation, it acted like a black hole and crushed everything around it. So that's exactly what we're anticipating. And I think we're about two years out to the top in cryptocurrencies, uh, which is when I think CPI will fall and match to the bond market. So globally, cash is trash. Governments are spending more than they make. This is really a phenomenon uh, that we'll likely count on for the rest of our lives. And it's due to two main macro uh, trends. One is there's not enough kids coming in to support uh, the aging population in developed worlds. And we're automating jobs with AI and robotics. So governments have no choice uh, they have to subsidize their populations to remain in control. So there's just about zero chance we will see any developed nation uh, government spend less than it makes. That's not going to happen and a primary reason to be long cryptocurrencies. Bonds are a great product that we would love to get our investors into, uh, but we've been out of those uh, for just about two years now. And it's been a smart move. And I think we've got another year to two years before the interest rate on bonds is going to catch up to the inflation rate and then create that black hole in markets once again. So we'll take a look at those charts. But right now, investors really have no other logical option. You want to be long stocks, cryptocurrencies, and commodities. These are likely to melt up until an alternative emerges. And so unless we're about to go into nuclear war and disrupt trade, uh, I see us being very stubborn with our positioning for about the next two years. 
And again, bonds won't be attractive until inflation's falling and catching up to yields. So we want that CPI to head towards three and a half and the 30 year treasury to head towards three. And somewhere in that intersection will be a beautiful play to buy bonds. That's why it's critical you watch our webinar every Monday, Wednesday, Friday to be ready for the sell alerts. And again, if you're not upgraded, you're gonna get the buy alerts, but you're not gonna get the sell alerts. You have to call Dean to upgrade at 505-322-7515. Uh, John, yeah, I'm expecting an absolute melt up in Ethereum for the next two years that we're very near uh, the end of the bond volatility, which has been the root pain for tech stocks. We'll take a look at that chart in a minute. Okay, I'll take a quick look at the headlines and we'll jump into the data. Justin, YouTube blocks all Russian state funded media channels globally. Russia to ban Instagram from Monday. A third Russian major general has been killed in the war in Ukraine. Western intelligence estimates that around 20 major generals would have been committed to the military reinvasion of Ukraine, implying a relatively high casualty rate during the two week long war. Biden says, make no mistake, inflation is largely the fault of Putin. I don't know who buys that, but um, they're certainly using the media to blame it on him. Now I do, admit that the inflation moving forward will be from this crisis and that we will have to recalculate uh, bond market and the CPI if this does not end in the next 30 days, or at least take a break. Uh, Bill Luby says the VIX has closed over 39 days in a row. When the VIX closes over 30, at least five days in a row, then closes under 30, forward SPX returns are very positive, 10 times normal in a week, six times in a month, four times in a quarter, and more than two times normal over the next year. Uh, in other words, he's saying this is a great time to, to be long stocks, assuming that, again, the VIX is gonna come down, which would absolutely happen as soon as we have diplomacy between Ukraine and Russia. My fear is that there will be uh, more pain before that occurs, because uh, Ukraine just won't uh, concede and neither will Russia to any of their terms. Russia threatens to abandon American astronaut who's in space station. Uh, we've got Germany refusing to treat Russians in the hospital, all sorts of um, McCarthyism type behavior occurring right now. Jack Posobiec says we're now seeing the systemic deglobalization of the world economy in real time. Uh, now, both sides are saying that there's going to be a false flag chemical or biological attack. Uh, so we will see if that's what escalates this next week or not. Uh, also, for those of us long crypto, expect some more volatility. Uh, Russians are liquidating crypto in the United Arab Emirates to safe, uh, seek safe havens. Uh, several clients are trying to liquidate billions of dollars. Ukraine's Kaleba, zero progress in talks with Russia Thursday. From F Fidelity, despite all the churn and unsettling world news, earnings estimates for 2022 are holding up well. Even minus energy, the estimate is 7%. Earnings will be key for markets this year. Another 30,000 Bitcoins were taken off of Coinbase today. Everyone is talking about energy for good reason. Energy stocks seem to be a pure play if you are a structural inflation bull. Here we see the five-year correlation between uh, 24 different industry groups. Uh, now, in my opinion, the energy play has been overdone. We played that. Uh, for all of last year, we held through lots of volatility. Uh, and my expectation, and if we look at the blue line, you can see it's pretty overbought here. Uh, and so is the, the CPI. So I'm expecting with the catalyst of a de-escalation, 
uh, to see a rotation out of value back into growth, potentially for the next nine months. Uh, and so we're getting ready to cut our energy plays, uh, which we call value, and go big on our growth plays, which would be the triple Q uh, or GBTC or ETHE, depending on which product you're following in our program. And then we'll be right back as soon as we get that oil back down to 80 range. The U.S. bond market's down 6.6% from its peak in August of 2020. This is now the longest 581 days and largest correction in bonds that we've seen in recent history. And this data is going back to 1996. So I'm predicting a relief rally in bonds uh, probably for the rest of the year and that this will benefit tech stocks and Ethereum and Bitcoin primarily. Uh, but I don't think we're at the bottom of bonds. I think it's going to take a full two years plus uh, to get to the very bottom in the bond market cycle here. And so this will be potentially one of the longest bond market crashes in history uh, outside of what we saw through the 70s. Lance Roberts pulled up a chart uh, through the 70s, says, don't dismiss the fact that the 1974 market correction was called a black bear market because the bottom of that decline, no one wanted to own equities. And it was, again, due to oil crisis. Uh, the energy costs must come down or it will create a recession. So we're monitoring that. It can take several months at these prices, uh, but they must come back down. And so he's pointing out the oil embargo, the uh, price controls, Nixon resignation, and this big stock market crash that went from 1972 and bottomed out in 1974. Uh, here we have Trump warning that if Biden becomes president, you'll be paying $7 gas and they're going to tell you to get rid of your car. Uh, so funny how that did play out. Russian Foreign Ministry says the CIA is coordinating with Ukrainian extremists to use chemicals against civilians and wants to put blame on us. So both sides are saying that. Is it time for value to shine again? Here is the periodic table for the 1940 to 1980 period. Large value, LV, and small value certainly dominated the leaderboard in those days. I continue to think that the 40s are an important analog to today, as well as the 60s. Uh, so uh, with the 40s, we had this huge debt ratio to GDP, and we're forced to do quantitative easing. Uh, and I believe that we will have to uh, manage the bond market until that debt to GDP ratio has fallen significantly. Now we got a free trial guess is inflation is the fault of the Fed, not Putin. Uh, they think we are talking that they're talking to imbeciles. Unfortunately, a lot of people are imbeciles, I'm afraid. Um, and this pandemic has proven that. We've still got people walking around with masks outside by themselves here in New Mexico, just mind boggling. Okay, so here's this little periodic table with the returns. Uh, so gold on the bottom of the leaderboard for all of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, but it had its reign uh, during heavy inflation and extreme interest rate hikes from 72 to 76. Uh, just kick some serious butt. Uh, before that, you were seeing the energy or the value stocks outperform uh, for the 40s through the 60s. So we'll look at whether or not we think we can have sustainable inflation for a decade. I do not believe we will. Um, so I'm not super excited to go all in on gold and silver, even though it's been doing very well over the last year. Um, so we'll take a look at gold and silver uh, absolutely in this presentation. Uh, so again, over the 10-year the cycle, I think we're going to see emerging markets outperform and oil and gas companies. It's really just in this next nine-month period that I'm expecting uh, the NASDAQ and Ethereum and Bitcoin to outperform. So a small relief rally in an oversold bond market. BlackRock hit by $17 billion of losses 
on Russian exposure. Here's an update on China. Okay, are you ready? This was a big one, your weekly thread on what's happening in Chinese markets. The nickel oil gets saved. A lot of people are furious about this. A good advertisement to get into DeFi, uh, which is like Uniswap. That's where our private equity fund makes money, providing liquidity to people who don't want to mess around with uh, centralized exchanges. Also, Coinbase just banned 25,000 wallets because they're Russian. Uh, heck, even DuckDuckGo, which was supposed to be the non-censored search engine, is now censoring Russian data. So just mind-boggling. You cannot trust centralized assets uh, because they become corrupt. The nickel whale gets saved. A wild story of how a Chinese tycoon broke the nickel market after taking a huge short position on the metal of which his company is the world's largest producer. Chinese ADRs collapsed 10% in a single day, the worst sell-off since 2008. The SEC listed five Chinese companies at risk of delisting should they refuse to show their books to American auditors, stoking panic every ADR will eventually be booted out. Now, this is how you take the conflict and make it much worse. If the US starts picking on China, for buying assets from Russia. That's how this quickly gets into a mega stock crash. And that's what would cause me to most likely exit our stock positions, go to the dollar and bet big on the VIX. And we're already betting big on the VIX, but we're doing it hedged against stocks. Uh, so much less risk from that standpoint currently. ESG makes an impact. Norway's 1.3 trillion sovereign wealth fund snubs Chinese sportswear stock leaning due to concerns over its ties with Xinjiang, of the uh, supposed uh, slave labor is occurring. Will other big funds follow in ditching their Chinese investment? China sets a 5.5% economic growth target for this year, which most economists and even China's number two agree is quite ambitious. So we're expecting China to really ramp up the printing as US stops the printing. And they do this. They, they really do take turns uh, cycling back and forth. And so this can be a great time to be long emerging markets. Data shows overseas investors sold 5.5 billion worth of Chinese government bonds in February, the biggest ever outflow. One theory blames Russia-related EM redemptions. Another says Russia may be behind the selling. There's that outflow of bonds. China doubles the yuan trading ban for the ruble as banks try to cope with the Russian currency volatility. So China's getting a nice discount on all these important goods from Russia now. Stephen Mitalisky says, doesn't the fact that anyone would even try to illegally corner the nickel market without fear of prison show how totally corrupt the entire global Political climate is, yeah. Uh, this last couple of years has been a great advertisement to get your money out of the system, get it on something that can't be controlled by governments. China credit stress reaches new extremes in the USD market. For those of you asking earlier, junk yields above 25% mean the primary market won't function properly anytime soon. And again, we live in a world where bad news means more money printing, more expansion of debt. Uh, and a good economy with a strong labor market means the opposite. So you want to buy when everything's bad and sell when everything's good, uh, when governments want to manipulate markets through money printing. Uh, so everything's pretty bad right now. <laughs> so we want to be long. Um, Omicron sp spreads in China. Hopefully they don't censor me for saying that word. Uh, so they're still doing zero policy in China. So expect more uh, inflation out of China due to this. Diddy halts plans for Hong Kong IPO. Chinese regulators aren't yet satisfied with the security of its sensitive user data. Uh, now we just saw that they don't have this, but uh, WHO advised Ukraine to destroy everything in their bio labs to prevent any spills. What exactly, supposedly there's 20 bio labs there. What has the US been up to with all this 
uh, bioweaponry across the entire globe. It's all coming to light. The White House was weighing an interagency review of ways to boost natural gas exports to Europe. However, the interagency review has been shelved after some argued it would counter the administration's effort to wean the US off fossil fuels consumption and production and tackle climate change. So it, I'm expecting the House and Senate to flip red uh, this November, uh, which would be another good reason to get out of these energy products uh, at the right time. Breaking Russia is moving its armed forces into position to surround Kiev. Uh, I believe we will see a lot of heat in the coming week uh, to, it seems they have two strategies, one surround Kiev and starve it out uh, medieval style and the others to uh, capture all the nuclear power plants, similar goal for both. And I think the Russians will achieve this within the next 14 days and get that diplomacy they, they need for a victory. Uh, so we need to carefully follow this and get ready to sell UVXY, sell boil, and go big on tech and, and short oil also. So those are the two big plays I see coming up. Now, again, if that doesn't happen and uh, the U.S. starts picking on China, this could escalate to a much bigger problem than it is currently. Uh, this fellow has an interesting prediction. The Fed has backed themselves into a corner. If the Fed raises 50 basis points this month, it's the right move, but the S&P 500 gets killed. And again, Powell told us straight up he's not going to do that uh, in a congressional hearing just a week and a half ago. If the Fed raises 25 basis points this month, SPX rallies, but inflation roars on. I think two is what's about to happen. So we're perfectly positioned for that. Uh, with our current portfolio. Either the Fed crashes the market or loses their credibility. Well, I think they've already lost their credibility. Uh, okay, not isolated to nickel at the LME. The entire system is corrupt. The last six weeks from Canada to Russia to SWIFT to the LME has been a rolling advertisement for digital assets in a completely new system. Now, Bitcoin can act like gold, okay, which is a $13 trillion market. Uh, to get there, Bitcoin would have to go up about 18 times. Okay, but you want to replace the financial system, you need an operating system to do it. And that's what Ethereum is there for. So while a 10 to 20 times return on Bitcoin is possible, we could be looking at much larger returns in Ethereum. And if you're long Polygon, which makes Ethereum uh, competitive with Bitcoin, that one could have even more extreme returns. Senate aligns with House, avoids government shutdown. They passed some crazy 2,700-page package that nobody read at midnight last night. I think it was for 1.3 trillion, uh, with about 13.4 billion going to Ukraine. If you follow that, uh, all the money the U.S. sends to Ukraine disappears. It's the most corrupt country. Uh, that's been a, just a, a way to just illegally get money out of out of U.S. and into corrupt people's hands. So there we go. This government loves spending money. Don't bet against the U.S. government spending money. Less than a week before the Fed is supposed to raise rates, the VIX is still in the 30s. The Fed has never raised rates with the VIX this high. Rather, they typically cut rates when volatility is high. Now, perhaps the market really wants rates to go up. Maybe this will be bullish to see the, the slow but steady rate hikes. I, I think that the market does need that. And so in this chart, uh, they're comparing the volatility index to the rate hike cycle. And so uh, here's where you got that beautiful Bitcoin rally right here. Okay, so Trump comes in. Immediately, they start hiking interest rates, which makes the bond market tend to lose until they stop. And so um, here we are. We're coming into that next cycle where bonds are likely to lose. So imagine that, a four-year potential period where bonds are a losing asset. And most of the world's hedged by being long bonds with what they call risk parity. So this could be a very, very, very good time. VIX comes down, rates go up. People are forced into uh, stocks. And again, we believe Ethereum is going to be your best bet. 
Fixed income doesn't react well to accelerating inflation at a four decade high. Who would have thought? Higher rates in a historically over indebted economy, the market is doing the Fed's hike cycle for them. Things are likely to break faster than, than one thinks. Uh, so he's got all the treasury yields. Um, so yeah, we do need to pay attention to the HYGLQD and TLT. We really want all three of those to stop crashing and go for the rest of the year uh, for what I'm predicting. We'll take a look at those charts. Food inflation is rising at 9.2%. So look for lots of civil wars in poor countries. Uh, so just remarkable the problem that we're going to have this year with food. The U.S. will not be providing Patriot missile defense batteries to Ukraine, as such actions would force the U.S. to send troops into Ukraine. And Lavrov says, we're not planning to attack other countries. We didn't attack Ukraine in the first place. <laughs> and there's no inflation. Um, the rules are simple. They lie to us. We know they're lying. They know we know they're lying, but they keep lying to us and we keep pretending to believe them. <laughs> uh, DuckDuckGo shows you can you can't back a non ideological platform. It will always, always turn left wing. Putin appears to have abandoned his uh, Mark Rubio uh, super pro war. All the all all. All of the U.S. government is extremely pro-war. This is definitely bipartisan. Putin appears to have abandoned the initial plan of installing a puppet leader in Ukraine. New plan appears to be encircle and pound on Kiev, uh, seize Mariupol and Odessa, wear down Ukraine's military, then dictate terms for ending the war. So, yep, I think that's exactly what's about to happen. Satellite photos show Russian convoy outside Kiev appears to have dispersed to surround areas. Uh, Russia's aim over the next 24 to 48 hours for Marco Rubio, complete the perimeter to encircle Ukraine troops in Chernihiv, link forces down in southeast of Ukraine to encircle resistance in Mariupol. In 15 days, they have over half of KIA's uh, as they did in 10 years in Afghanistan. As so you can see, they're encircling Ukraine here. China stocks are acting like something is about to happen. Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent. Would Biden actually announce some sort of sanctions against China? If so, what are we trying to do? I, I don't see it, but we'll be ready if it happens. No country is printing more than China and the PBOC right now. They are saving their Chinese state-owned enterprises, banks, against falling real estate prices. The PBOC will keep cutting the RRR for their banks, similar policies to what the Fed did in 2008 and 9 to save US banks. Uh, and that's why we want to be long Asia. US is heading towards the digital dollar. Peter Zahan says Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan Chase just pulled out of Russia. Drug companies are among the very, very few left. Ukraine is a model for how Taiwan could respond if China violates the country's sovereignty by attacking, said a senior US defense official. Again, I don't see China invading Taiwan. Uh, while it made sense for Russia to attack during a highly inflationary period of time, uh, when they are uh, rich in agriculture and energy, uh, China is not. So China would be much more likely to, to make a move during a, a low inflationary time because uh, they don't have access to food and energy. So this would be a very, very bad strategic time for China to make such a move. Uh, more likely the US causes a conflict with China if China keeps supporting Russia, it seems to be what could make this go from a problem in Europe to a global uh, world war. Okay, all the talk now is a, a bio attack. Both sides are saying it's a false flag by the other. 
So we'll see if that occurs next week and how people respond. Here's the 10-year yield against inflation. Uh, so the red is where the inflation rates over the yield. And so you can see since the 60s, uh, there's been very, very few times where bond yields were less than inflation. And so uh, if you do look at the few times where it's pink, uh, bond yields go up the whole time. Okay, so it's just not normal for the inflation rate to be way over the bond yield rate. Uh, but also note that you get a massive crash in the CPI uh, when it gets to those extremes. So those bond yields will go up until the inflation turns a corner and then it's gonna fall off a cliff. And that's a, a basically what I'm expecting to occur very soon and why I think we're gonna have a relief in yields uh, which means you want to be long again, the NASDAQ and tech and the catalyst is for a de-escalation to come through. Now, if we don't de-escalate, this inflation could run hot until we do, okay? Because energy costs and food costs are going to remain very, very elevated. Food costs are almost certainly to be elevated uh, for at least probably the next two years due to these disruptions in fertilizers and crops. Uh, the energy cost could go down in a snap, if, if we de-escalate, so. Joe Manchin says it makes no sense at all for us to import energy from hostile actors when we're blessed with an abundant supply of natural resources here at home. We must immediately increase our oil and gas production. And that means both the administration and industry must step up to the plate. Uh, this fellow has a whole thread about our activity with bioweapons in Ukraine. Um, I'm not going to get into it. it. All that's important from us is both sides are claiming the other side's going to do a false flag bio attack, and that could cause an escalation. So from our standpoint, that's all that matters in terms of re reacting on our end. Okay, Chai Girl says we've spent the last 15 years conditioned to buy the dip on tech. Uh, because the Fed will save the day. This market is completely different. I would argue that we've not seen this wide of a natural demand supply dislocation in commodity markets since the industrial revolution. And she's again an energy expert. I agree with her over this 10 year cycle, uh, but I do believe again, energy costs will fall viciously into midterms. Okay, Biden needs to get inflation down before November for the Democrats to have a chance at anything for the House and Senate. Um, so I would expect that we get a de-escalation, a crash in energy costs, and it needs to happen soon. Uh, otherwise, we're gonna have a recession and a huge mess heading into midterms. 11 months of wages declining relative to inflation. So we had four years of hourly earnings going up faster than inflation. And now we've had a year of the opposite. Wait, a one and a half trillion bill that's 2,700 pages long was introduced into Congress this week. And it's not even expected to last through 2022. And again, we need to run a $2 trillion deficit uh, to keep the stock market up. Uh, and that's indefinitely. I would be shocked if the US spends less uh, than a $2 trillion deficit uh, ever again without a major fiasco. Okay, someone's asking why you use UVXY instead of SQQQ. Yeah, they're different. So we, we're actually in a strategy where we'd be long the triple Q and simultaneously long UVXY. Okay, UVXY can go up massively relative to SQQQ. So if I just wanted to be short the market, I would go long SQQQ and I could hang on to that till I thought we we're at a bottom and it would be proportionally up relative to the return uh, to the downside. UVXY is much different product. You need to think of it as insurance. So a complete blowout happens and UVXY goes up a thousand percent. It will greatly outperform the SQQQ if there's a big panic. 
So in general, we can be long stocks with let's say 80% of our portfolio and then uh, hedge it with a 10 to up to 20% UVXY position. And if the market rallies up from here, our long side will make more than the insurance policy loses. On the other hand, if we get an outright stock crash that's devastating, UVXY can make more than we're losing on our long position. If you go along the triple Q and you go along the SQQ, you're gonna break even, okay? And just pay fees. So, uh, so we need something that has an asymmetrical return, or in other words, it can go up faster than the other products going down. Ukrainian media published six Russian demands to end the war. Uh, one, refusal to join NATO and neutral status of Ukraine. Russia becomes one of guarantors. Two, Russia becomes second state language. Three, recognition of Russian annexation of Crimea. Four, recognition by Ukraine of independence of separatist republics in Donbass within boundaries of pre-war regions, including territories now controlled by Ukraine. And uh, denazification, prohibition of activities of ultra nationalists. Okay, so that's what they want to end the war. Uh, it's all Putin's fault. So here's Biden and cost of gas, and then here's the war. China stocks trading in US tumble down 10%. Uh, so here's a look at that. NASDAQ in China, it is massively down. And I think this is a great opportunity building into that position and expecting outperformance over, over a long time frame. We're looking at a decade cycle coming up. Uh, Mark Rubio, I, this guy drives me nuts, but he does publish a lot of good content here. Uh, things will start to turn soon inside of Russia. The inability to import will be uh, is going to be paralyzing the manufacturing sector. And as more businesses close, unemployment will quickly rise. Putin may be able to lie to them about Ukraine, but he won't be able to hide the truth about the economy. I'd agree with that. I think, I think this has to come to a resolution in 30 days or less. So that's the time frame I'm seeing that we will exit UVXY boil, short uh, oil with drip, and start building into our Ethereum play. And the only thing that would make me think otherwise is China gets involved. And then you have a true uh, world war on our hands. Um, and again, if we start to disrupt trade with China, the entire US corporate sector is gonna collapse. So we, we would absolutely get out of stocks if it looks like we're gonna really have a, a big conflict with China. I think it's very unlikely that occurs. I think we're gonna get diplomacy, uh, a resolution and a period of peace in a, in a much longer war that's coming at us. Uh, Natalie says, we've said it before, we'll say it again. It's better to have a volatile appreciating asset, Bitcoin, rather than a stable depreciating currency, the dollar. Huge, South Korea just selected a Bitcoin friendly president overnight. Janet Yellen says, I don't expect a recession in the US. Savan Henrik says, the only time the Fed raised rates with consumer sentiment this low was in the 70s and early 80s, resulting in two back-to-back -back recessions. And we'll look at the, the differences of the 70s compared to today. I, I think we're heading towards peak inflation and it's gonna fall and that we're really in a deflation era, again, due to too few children to support everybody growing old and too many jobs being replaced by AI and robotics. And so that's really the big trend that's gonna be, and, and plus $300 trillion in debt dragging on the economy. So if interest rates go up very much, it crashes everything. Uh, so the days of a 20% interest rate on a, on a bond from the government, will never come back again, not at these levels of debt. Russia's headed towards the biggest inflation spike this century. Its first full week since the invasion began, prices for do new domestic cars climbed 17%, televisions jumped 15%, and 
Bloomberg Economics sees inflation peaking at an annual 19% rate. Breaking Stripe, major merchant, uh, that's who we use, now supports Bitcoin and crypto payments. So the, the writing's on the wall. All the big money is going long Bitcoin. It's a beautiful product and it has a massive future ahead. And the, the latest executive order uh, was not a problem, uh, which came out this week from Biden. Uh, 13.6 billion to Ukraine. So yeah, it's a slimy country. With all the bright spots in our economy, record job growth and higher wages, too many families are struggling to keep up with the bills. Inflation is robbing them of the gains they might otherwise feel. I get it. That's why my top priority is getting prices under control. Uh, so they are talking about a new stimulus package to help people out with rising energy costs. Jim Bianco, a thread on the LME situation and why it should bother anyone in markets, a blatant disregard for the rules to protect one Chinese tycoon against the market. This is far worse than GameStop. I tried to keep this as simple as possible. Please correct in the replies. Ting Sheng is, a, is China's largest nickel producer, 40 billion in revenues. It is run by its founder, Wang Wangda. His moniker is Big Shot. Take that to mean he has a huge ego. He shorted 100,000 tons of nickel. Yes, that's a huge amount. He was counseled to rein in this massive short, but he's a big shot and runs Ting Shen, so he knows better. In retrospect, this position was causing market imbalances. This imbalance often shows up when all markets are stressed, like they were are with Russia invading Ukraine. The market moved against him enough to get a margin call. By all accounts, he simply said he did not want to pay for it. So the LME gave him a reprieve. In other words, the LME ignored its own rules. Why? Maybe because he's a big shot, a major player, and his broker was the state-owned China Construction Bank. And the LME is owned by the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Hong Kong, as of 2020, is now part of China. When he was given the, his reprieve, the market had an offsides player that could be squeezed. So prices rocketed 250% to 100,000. At that point, he could not pay the margin. Not to worry, the LME halted trading and canceled trades back down to 50K. This got him back to mark to market level he could pay. So all those traders that correctly assessed the situation and went long in legitimate trades lost all their profits between 50 to 100,000. Now Big Shot wants to stay short, and the LME, which initially said nickel trading would restart tomorrow, put that on hold. Fear is the short imbalances still exist, and the price rockets back to 100,000 and doubles his margin. And then they have to cancel more trades. So they did shut that market down today. I think it's going to open back up uh, Sunday. Inflation adjusted short term interest rates at negative 7.8 currently are the lowest they have been since the 40s, and specifically since the end of the 1951 period. Even as someone who has been, and this is Lynn Alden, even as someone who has been on the rather inflationary camp for a few years. The war in Ukraine is likely to push inflation even higher than my pre-war base case has been. Bifurcated supply chains and commodity protectionism add more fuel to an inflationary bonfire. Here we see the performance of commodities during economic expansions. Commodities have done better during this expansion than all previous expansions. That doesn't mean it's coming to an end, but it does give some perspective on how big this rally has been. And again, Russia spiking oil to 134 was definitely not expected by most. In, in the black line, you can see this return. Only return similar to it was uh, 1914 to 1918. So while I do believe this will be a great asset over the next five to 10 years, probably about five, we're still expecting a pullback over the next likely nine months. We'll look at the bond markets uh, trend over the last two years. Okay, that gets us far back in time on that. 
Uh, okay, so let's look at the bond market. If we zoom out a bit, uh, this is what they call a flattening of the yield curve. You, the, if the space between the 10 and the two uh, gets closer, you're heading towards an inversion. So we almost inverted right here. It was one of the smaller spreads we've had. Um, so in general, the yield curve inverts, then it steepens, and then about 16 months later, you get a crash. So uh, this is actually a good period of time for how we're positioned. It's not till the 10 year and the 30 year go straight up to a very high yield that we'll get worried that there's gonna be a, a recessionary crash. Uh, meanwhile, the two year is at 1.74. So that's now calculating seven rate hikes, potentially four this year and three next year. As soon as the two year tops out, we'll have a good idea of uh, when the Fed's gonna stop hiking rates and most likely when will be that magical moment to, to buy bonds and get out of the way of just about everything else. Here's a look at that yield curve so we can uh, see it over time. So uh, let's look at the 2008 crash. So yield curve inverts, goes negative. So we're kind of in the early 2005 period-ish. Okay, and then it uh, stayed inverted for over a year and then it started to steepen. So now the two years staying flat and the long end is going up. And then you get your big crash. Okay, same thing happened in the dot-com bubble. Same thing happened in the 90s crash. Okay, so it's been a pretty reliable indicator. Uh, and also it's showing the same uh, in the 80s here. So we haven't inverted yet. We don't need to believe we're headed into a recession anytime soon, uh, probably about two years out from now. Okay, let's look at the yield curve now uh, in this manner. So that's a ugly, ugly yield curve. Uh, what we wanna note is the two year, let's add a few more. So we can see this two years has been flying up. The inflation has been going up much more than anyone expected, causing the two year to go up. Uh, but the expectation for growth and inflation in the future has, has been not going up at the same pace. And we've actually inverted the 20 and 30 year. So very ugly long-term outlook uh, in the bond market. Now here's what a healthy yield curve looks like. So if we go back to October of 2020, before Trump passed a trillion in stimulus and Biden two trillion, uh, we didn't have the inflation problem at all. And you have this very healthy yield curve. Okay, so too much money printing caused this inflation and screwed up the bond market. Uh, looks like the probability is a 25 basis point hike coming this Wednesday, and I think the markets will love it. Uh, 50 basis points would be a surprise at this point. The VIX future curve is in backwardation. It's at 30, very elevated. Uh, if this goes down, expect a melt up in stocks. They have not been able to push the VIX down though. So any more volatility and this will get extremely uh, extreme backwardation and make UVXY go up. Uh, but yeah, we need moves over 2% right now to see big, big returns in UVXY. Okay, here's our three favorite cryptocurrencies. And so if we go from this uh, view, uh, we can see Bitcoin's been trading down 30% over this period. Uh, but Ethereum's up 52% and Polygon uh, up 300%, up as much as 750. So it's more than 50% uh, crash in Polygon. Uh, we've had a, a large, about a, almost 50% decline in Ethereum and more like a 30% decline in Bitcoin. Um, now, I'm gonna hide Polygon and Ethereum. Okay. 
And so I just want to point out this level of volatility in Bitcoin is completely normal. And it's usually the beautiful time to get into it is after a big, long, nasty sell off. And so I've personally held through many 50% crashes in Bitcoin. And I believe this is a great time to go along this asset. Okay, reverse repo, 1.5 trillion. So still a ton of extra money sitting, uh, being begged for by banks, which means uh, the bond market shouldn't fall off a cliff while this is elevated. This chart we're comparing being long spot oil with USO, natural gas spot uh, out of North America with boil, or being long with leverage the big US gas companies, the top 10 with NRGU. And if we zoom out to, let's say from here, uh, we've seen for a small minute, uh, natural gas outperformed on February 22nd. Then it had a 50% crash. It's made back uh, about 50, 40% of that crash. NRG has been a less volatile asset, uh, up 82% over this period. And being long spot oil, uh, did not have nearly the return of either of these two assets, only up 27%. And we hit that peak price of I think 137 oil right about right here. So you can see Boyle has the potential to greatly outperform everything. Uh, but so far, uh, we haven't rerouted US natural gas to Europe to save the day. They're planning on it. Um, so. Oil could be a very nice performer over this next year, uh, but I'll be selling it as soon as there's a de-escalation with Russia and Ukraine. This chart, we're looking at lumber futures relative to oil. And uh, if there's a big crash in lumber futures, there's possibly a warning sign that the crash in oil is coming. Um, so we're not seeing that at all, uh, but they are trading quite correlated as of recently. Most likely the main catalyst to get oil down will be a strategic release reserve from China and the US. Uh, maybe some more output from Iran if they can close the nuclear deal. And then uh, the main one will be de-escalation. And I do think we'll get a pretty significant sell-off uh, in, in oil. And, and we'll be buying back in the, probably at 80, I may go as low as lower than 80, but I'll be very happy to pick up NRGU when oil's back to 80. This chart, we're comparing copper to gold. Uh, if gold's outperforming copper, that's predicting lower interest rates. And so right now, uh, it absolutely is. It's been outperforming copper uh, for quite some time. It's been a close, close race. Uh, if we zoom in a bit, we can see, especially in the last few days. So this is predicting lower yields, which is important for how we're positioned. This chart, we're looking at yellow interest rates. If it's going up, rates are rising, going down, rates are falling. Net-net uh, since, uh, let's go to, let's go back to December when the tech wreck began. So in general, we can see the triple T interest rates went up and the triple T is up 18%. NRGU, three times big oil and gas companies, up 143%. NASDAQ's down 18. So do we think this trend will continue or is it about to revert? And again, I believe, as you know, it's about to revert within the next 30 days. Okay, so uh, here's the massive outperformance of emerging markets going up 400%. Well, the S&P 500 only returned 80%. Okay, so that's the type of outperformance I'm expecting from emerging markets over the next five to 10 years. Okay, so that's, uh, and that's again, US is gonna be in gridlock. We're not gonna be spending nearly as much money. We're gonna be running tight policy to fight inflation. China's doing the exact opposite. They don't have any inflation and they have lots of room to expand credit. So that's the type of outperformance I'm expecting for EDC over this coming cycle. Uh, 
uh, someone's asking, is a Chinese ETF a buyer? I would just follow the trading plan. So EDC is our play for Asia, which gives you three times leverage, 4,000 companies you get. You don't just get China, you get China, you get India. You used to get Russia, Russia's out of that index now. You get Vietnam, you get uh, Taiwan. So it's all of the best plays out of Asia with uh, EEM. Now, again, EEM had some pain uh, due to China cracking down on its industries um, and due to Russia getting pulled out of the index. Um, so, but, th but that, that seems to be pretty much over. All right, Russell 2000, if it's crashing, we'll, we'll be worried uh, trading flat. It did take a big leg down from this channel it was in, uh, but it's stabilized. So at this point, I'm not worried about the Russell 2000 uh, predicting any kind of pain in markets. Here's that massive drop in Europe. Uh, but to be fair, uh, it's been doing well. So from the 2020 May crash, uh, massive return. Let's be looking at it from, how about from March of last year, it had a maximum return of 22%. And it's just given up all of that and it's bouncing back. So I'm going to expect lots of spending and lots of QE. Now we did get a more hawkish uh, Fed or ex excuse me, ECB this week, which was a little bit surprising. Uh, but again, in general, This should be a very good buying opportunity, unless we're about to head into World War III. Okay, DXY, I've zoomed out a bit so you can see just how low it can go. And so during that period where China outperformed the US markets by almost, almost 10 to one, uh, with emerging markets, it was a little less than 10 to one. If it was just Chinese stocks, it was. Uh, we got this very weak dollar. Uh, so we're really at the strong end of what the dollar can potentially do. Um, and I believe it's going to fall for the next several years. The level I'm willing to bet it will fall to is 90 uh, before I'd expect a strong bounce. So we basically want to be in the current positioning, betting on inflationary assets, stocks, commodities, cryptocurrencies, until the dollar hits 90. Once the dollar hits 90, I will go big on bonds, uh, big on the dollar, and uh, potentially big on the VIX, depending on the circumstances. I think that's about two years out. So I'm going to go about two years out uh, to hit a move like that. Here's the Chinese currency zoomed out a bit. So you can see the Chinese currency is very, very strong. Uh, they have lots of room to expand credit against their ultra strong currency. Now, again, if this is going down, that means the Chinese currency is outperforming the dollar. So the dollar has been doing great. The Chinese yuan has been doing even better. Uh, okay, so now we're looking at another wipeout in Tencent and Alibaba. So perhaps the pain is not over for emerging markets, but boy, oh boy, Alibaba is down something like 70% from its high. Let me zoom out a bit. So from the top, uh, we got Taiwan Semiconductor down 27, Tencent down 54, Alibaba down 67. So if you're looking for a value play in tech, uh, EDC pretty much is these three plays. Uh, much of that entire ETF are just those three mega companies. Um, so you got your Amazon, you've got your software giant, and then you've got your chip producer. So um, I'm trying to think of a good parallel for Tencent. Uh, Alibaba's like Amazon, Taiwan Semiconductor's like NVIDIA, uh, and Tencent's just a massive, massive software company. So EDC and our safe strategy uh, is our largest position. Um, and again, I'm looking to add to that over time. Uh, 
Toyota, we're keeping a close eye on, is the single important company uh, representing uh, the pain from this conflict uh, through Europe and Japan. And it's been selling off down 21%. Okay, here's a look at the TLT. So my expectation in general is this rallies for the rest of the year. More stimulus is passed and then it breaks to a new low and we find a bottom uh, in about two years. And that's when the DXY is gonna hit 90. And that's when we're gonna wanna buy the TLT, except we'll use TMF, we're gonna buy the dollar. Um, and interest rates will be very high. So we're expecting the yield curve to invert and then steepen. And then we go for uh, potentially the big crash and uh, massive gain in bonds, massive gain in the dollar and a massive gain in the VIX. So again, I, I'm expecting that to be about two years out from today, unless we start picking a fight with China, then that could definitely speed up that. Um, so yeah, so look at this. It's been a bad time to be long bonds over this entire period. So if TLT is going down, yields are rising. Once again, we're expecting this to have a relief rally to, through midterms, pass more stimulus, and then crash it uh, into 2024. So perhaps you get uh, Trump or DeSantis takes uh, <laughs> the presidency and they plan a big crash in 2024. Uh, but I do expect a relief rally through midterms uh, to the end of the year. This is Tesla versus Ethereum. So either Tesla's got a big leg down or Ethereum's got a huge leg up, if we assume these trade correlated. And uh, again, these have been the two hottest tech stocks you could possibly have your hands on. And uh, assuming yields are going to fall, I'd expect a massive ripping higher on ETHE uh, coming up next. Okay, here's gold. So gold's been doing really well, um, but doesn't tend to do very well most of the time. Um, so a lot of people look at this chart and believe it's on the verge of a major breakout. We've also seen gold trade uh, exactly the opposite of Bitcoin. So I'm becoming more and more interested in uh, gold is a stagflation play um, and a way to balance our, our big cryptocurrency positions. Uh, at this point, we have stayed out of the way and have not made a big move yet. Here's a look at the leveraged TLT, TMF, and EUO. So uh, again, I think we make more money with tech stocks than we do with bonds right now, even though I'm expecting a rally in bonds. Um, we can also see this correlation to the dollar and the bond market. And so in general, as you know, um, expecting uh, the dollar to fall and for bond yields to, to fall uh, for the remainder of the year, essentially. And the main catalyst will be energy costs coming down after a de-escalation in Europe. Now we're zooming out, looking at copper miners, uh, rare earth metals, and uranium. If we go back to 2011's valuations, uh, rare earth metals and uranium are cheap compared to copper stocks, uh, which I found interesting when really zooming out. Those are the two plays we're long. Uh, if we zoom in though, uh, we've, we can see that uh, especially RMX has been trading with much more volatility uh, than copper miners. So lithium, uh, we need for batteries. And about three years out, it seems there's going to be an extreme shortage. So very bullish on REMX uh, over this decade. And then uranium, again, is going to be critical to all these climate change goals. So those are our two alternative energy uh, plays for uranium and essentially lithium and cobalt which you get from REMX. Now we got to remember China is the big player in REMX. So um, one member asked me, do you think if we start to sanction China, would REMX go up? 
And the answer is no, because they're the ones producing that. So we'd want to look at an alternative uh, player to REMX, which there is. There is an American-based lithium uh, ETF. So yeah, if we start to mess with China, this is going to get much worse. All right, here's the core inflation. Uh, we pr I was predicting it would be less than six and a half. And sure enough, came in at 6.4. Now, this is the inflation that strips out food and energy. So, um, so assuming the food and energy costs, or at least the, I don't think food's coming down, to be clear. But as long as the energy costs come down, I'm very confident that we will have peak inflation uh, soon. We may have to push forward our expectation of about as long as this conflict with Russia remains. Uh, but if that's the case, uh, we're going to have a lot of dovish surprises, falling inflation. And again, this will be a, a moonshot event for growth assets, so tech, crypto. If this inflation remains sticky and too high, uh, we've got big problems on our hands. And the Fed's going to probably have to go Paul Volcker on us and crash everything to fight inflation. So... This is the, the print I wanted to see, and it's uh, 0.1 less than I was hoping. I, I was going to be content if it was below six and a half. And again, got to realize this excludes food and energy. Okay, PPI seems to be flattening out. Uh, jobs keep ripping in. Uh, hard to trust the jobs data because they completely change it uh, every month. So. Not following that too closely right now for uh, interest rate expectations. Uh, the wage pressures continue, but not as high as inflation. Uh, now, here's the main stark difference between the 70s up to the 80s compared to today. Now, we are seeing this labor force rise. Uh, we're about 2 million jobs short of where we were previously, and we're about 2% below uh, the highest employment labor force participation rate we had uh, from 2014 to current. So the jobs are coming back online pretty, pretty fast. Um, so this is definitely going to put pressure on interest rates over time. But the 70s uh, is one of the highest growth of the labor force participation rate in U.S. history, especially during this stretch. Okay, so to believe we're going to have a 70s of inflation and raising interest rates and negative returns on stocks and bonds over a decade and uh, a huge stretch for gold to be the best performing asset. Uh, we'd have to really believe that this trend can continue. And uh, the data is not supporting that at all. Uh, in fact, we're having more people quit. Um, there's more job openings than there are people looking for jobs at a record level. I think we're going to have a hard time uh, keeping this trend up. But let's go ahead and look at the one-year trend. And it's it's going up. So this is headed in the right uh, direction here. OK, so some people are saying this is like the 70s. So if it's like the 70s, uh, the inflation pretty much never went below 4% 4, 4 for over a decade, and the inflation rate went as high as 14%. So my expectation is that's not the case, that this will fall uh, for the next two years, and that peak inflation is here, and that really the macro forces are too overwhelming. Um, so I am willing to bet that the inflation will remain hot uh, as many months as the war with Russia remains intact. Uh, so, I, and I think the war with Russia will be over in less than 30 days. So I was expecting peak inflation in March. I'm going to recalibrate that to be May. I, I would believe worst case peak inflation hits in May and that the war with Russia is over in less than 30 days. If this does drag on and turns into a multi-year war and we drag China into it and oil stays above 100, Sure, we can definitely uh, prepare for that at this point. I don't think Russia can afford it, um, nor Europe. 
nor the West. So uh, energy costs must go down. Uh, the pain for Russia is nothing compared to the pain for the rest of the world in terms of what happens if oil stays above 100. They've got to push it back down, especially before midterms. OK, uh, the credit of the banks growing, this is good for stocks, of course. Uh, if the government's going to spend less, then the banks need to keep the credit growing. Uh, credit cards have been growing rapidly, kind of odd. The savings rate plummeted last month. So everybody's expecting consumer credit to go off the charts and instead it fell. And meanwhile, spending went up 3.8%. Uh, and consumer spending in the US hit an all time high. So earnings expectations are remaining very strong for corporations. And I believe this is a beautiful time to be long stocks. Okay, now for betting on the dollar going down over time, we really wanna see growing deficits. We call them the twin deficits. So the trade balance hit a record. Okay, we exported less than we imported by a record amount. So, so we shoved dollars into the world uh, at a record pace, and then we devalued our currency at a record pace uh, via the twin deficits. So they just passed another one and a half trillion dollar package last night. So this is again, one of the key reasons to be long stocks, cryptocurrencies, uh, if you believe debt's gonna grow and trade deficits. Now, for some reason, the Chinese seem to have added January and February into one figure uh, so if you doubled this, it would be at 480. So this did slow down a little bit on average. And uh, so, and then this one slowed down a bit. So we did see a slowdown in China in February. Uh, but again, they've set a target for 5.5% GDP and they've got a collapsing real estate market. So expect them to ramp up spending as the US slows down. All right, so uh, the Fed's balance sheet has ended at $8.9 trillion. I was thinking it might hit nine. It stopped just short of that. So what comes next is two years of rate hikes. They'll probably allow the balance sheet to run off a little bit. And then you're going to get a crisis. And then they're going to do what? They're going to ramp this thing up to uh, next thing you know, it's going to be at $18 trillion. So the crooks in Congress. So yeah, let's look at that pattern. Um, so again, they, they didn't really grow very much over this period until you have a crisis. Then they magically double the def, uh, the federal balance sheet, try to run it flat for a little bit, uh, get another crisis and they jump it up another trillion dollars. And then they get another crisis. So they do another ridiculous $2 trillion. Then uh, they let it run off here until you get a crisis and then kaboom. And then we did the biggest jump in history. So from 4 trillion to 9 trillion. So they're gonna let it tighten and run off, ruin the bond market, force everybody in stocks and cryptos, let the long end go up until it crashes everything. And then the crooks in Congress are gonna go past the biggest spending bill in history again. And the central bank's gonna buy it all. And next thing you know, a decade from today, the US balance sheet is going to be at $20 trillion. And Bitcoin and Ethereum is going to be priced so high, you won't even be able to believe it. Uh, and the same thing for Europe. So here's a look at the ECB's balance sheet doing a very similar move. Uh, it's highly correlated to the US. So they're just doing the same thing. All right, guys. So I hope you enjoyed today's show. Uh, we're about to review asset allocation and track records. But this is where your video ends if you're not a paid member. Upgrade now. There's three spots available at special pricing each day. If you call Dean at 505-322-7515. That's 505-322-7515.